Wow. There are so many things happening politically in Humboldt County. It's hard to keep track of them all. Being a responsible citizen and participating in democracy means more than just voting, but the system is so complex. It's hard enough to keep track of everything that is happening, let alone understanding how the process works and how to have my voice heard. I need some clarity. I need to talk to somebody to help me wrap my head around some things. Spent a lot of time thinking about the uh, the wind power project that's happening in Terrigen, oh, uh, yeah. Bear River, and Monument Ridges. You've been yeah. hearing about this, oh, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea, you know. We, need, we really need to start shifting to alternative energy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, that is undeniable. I will give you that. But I'm not entirely sure that this is the way to do it. You what know? do you mean? Well, I guess, and, and from what I've heard, uh, this, in theory, could provide renewable energy to 40,000 homes, um, which sounds great, right? Uh, I mean, that's a start. Like we absolutely most of the have to stop using fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it won't stay in the area necessarily. Um, so it won't help if we lose power again? No. GDs. No. I, I don't believe so because it's still tied to the grid, right? So it still would go out into the larger world. So, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily stay here. Um, it's not going to give us uh, energy independence or anything like that. Um, but, you know, that's, that's not a big deal, right? I would be fine with providing clean energy to other people, too, right? As long as we're transitioning out right, of absolutely. fossil fuels. But I think that the, it's really the environmental impacts of it and just all of it. There are a lot of other issues with the project that I think kind of cancel out some of the benefits. Interesting, like what? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, to, to tie it to the grid, um, there are gonna have to be about 25 miles of clear cuts, about 80 to 100 feet wide. You know, like any, you've know, been out in the woods before and walked a power line, right? You think about right. that, you know, they had to go in and cut down all those trees before they could put those power lines in, wow. right? Yeah, that's seems so like a cutting lot of down the all the in habitat. A lot of habitat, right? A lot of things live in those trees, right? And you know what? I think that that is the main thing that's giving me trouble is that this could be good for humans. Um, it could be good for some humans in the short term, but think about it, we really need to. If we're trying to change the way that we get our energy, we need to be thinking about more than just ourselves right in this moment, right? Um, and there's so many possible impacts to birds, right? Of course, we oh, all yeah. kind of know about that. And that is something that the right wing used as an excuse against uh, renewable energy previously, but they're like legitimate concerns. Um, well, we have a lot of birds in this area. We have so many birds in this area. Uh, and I read in the, um, the final environmental impact report, which by the way, is in so dense and complex and hard to read. Uh, that I think that a lot of people don't actually get into it. So luckily, there was at a planning commission meeting, um, city or county staff that broke it down. Uh, but it's estimated that 150 to 300 birds could be killed per year for the life of the project. That's but, but that's not considered significant because they're common birds. <sighs> right? That's a terrible. Right? Isn't that how things become uncommon? Is that we kill them? Uh, but then also the, the, but what about all that, like we have a lot of birds that are, I feel like protected birds that travel through this area. That right. Not... That's very true. And uh, the way that the law works is that uh, you can mitigate for that. So there are things that you can change in your project to make it slightly better for those species. Or in some cases, you can get um, what they call an incidental take permit. What does that mean? Which, so you get that from the Department of uh, Fish and Game or Fish and Wildlife. You basically get a permit to kill protected species if you're doing it in the process of an activity that is not illegal. Say, pre harvesting a resource like wind to make energy. So you can get a permit to kill a certain amount of um, birds of prey, specifically. Well, like a bald eagle. Like a bald eagle. Right, so you, you basically you get a permit to do that as long as you're doing that in the process of something that is not illegal. 
So you can do that. Uh, and, and, and that was that was another interesting thing that I learned from the uh, environmental impact report is that they don't, because I knew that birds of prey were going to be at risk for this. And so I tried to search the document for things like eagle mortality or, you know, death of avian species. But they use different terminology for it. And at one point in the EIR, they say that, you know, it is estimated that or you know that the mitigations will be in effect to handle individual birds that are taken out of, that are accidentally removed from the population, I believe is the way that they phrase it. Accidentally removed from the population. Yeah, you know, killed. Um, which is really, and I, you know, I have to say that this whole process, because this is such a controversial project, uh, I've really learned a lot about how all of this works, right? Just the, you mean the process the of the process. process. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, how somebody goes about getting the permits to do something like this, right? And it, it is harvesting a resource. This is a resource that we have here, right? Um, but going back to the birds, uh, the... Your tribe is planning on releasing condors. Oh, yes. And this is the exact sort of area where condors would be. Yes. Right? And the idea that we could go through, like, you know, one, one agency or entity can go through a process of reintroducing a species uh, that could then be hit by a turbine. But the mitigation for that is that these birds would be fit with, um, you know, I heard it referred to at the meeting as uh, backpacks, like condor backpacks. Which like puts a really cute picture in my mind, That's right? right? But um, like, how are they gonna you, like? Gotta, gotta get the bird. You gotta put the backpack on it or whatever it is. Uh, but they have like radio waves on them. So uh, when a bird who is wearing one of these devices gets close to the turbines, it'll shut the turbines down. That's an interesting idea. How long does it take for a turbine to stop spinning, though? Yeah, I mean, it seems like something that is. How, how, how wide or how long are one of those turbine blades? I mean, they're huge. These are going to be 600 foot turbines. So, um, and 47 of them, I believe, is what they've decided on now. 47, 600 foot turbines. And uh, in the, the simulated photo that I saw in the environmental impact report, because um, they're showing, because another one of the impacts is that they're building roads. They have to build roads to actually get all these turbines to where they're going. Uh, and the blades are so large that they have to be on special extended trucks that there are just certain, there are certain roads they can't take because they can't make those corners carrying these huge turbines up there. Wow, so they're yeah. probably going to have to cut down even more trees in order to build those roads. Yes. To get turbines up there. Totally. Well, and that's, you know, one of the, the benefits of this project that is being touted is that it will create jobs. Um, and I, I believe the estimate is 300 construction jobs, like in the building of the project will be 300. So a lot of that I think is like in roads, road building, stuff like that, building but the pads that they're going to be on. Non-permanent jobs. Only 15 operations and maintenance jobs, as they call it. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, there's an awful lot that I don't know about how a wind turbine works, but it turns out they spontaneously combust sometimes? What? Yes, because of friction, because they're turning, so there's all that friction, so there has to be oil inside of them. And one estimate that I've seen, um, you know, I'm not going to even tell you a number because I can't remember the number offhand, but they, they require barrels and barrels and barrels of oil for lubrication to help prevent them from bursting into flames. So, I mean, the though technically the power the, the electricity that they're making is not being derived from fossil fuels. Yeah, it seems like there's right. a lot of petrochemicals that will go into the manufacturing and yes. maintenance of these. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a good thing that they last forever. Uh, and they don't. That's the thing, is they don't. And the estimated life of this project, which I don't even really know what that means, if that's like before the turbines break down, if that's just how long this particular company, Terrigen, wants to run the project, but they estimate it to be at 30 years. So yeah, what happens after 30 years? And how much energy is produced in that 30 years? Right. Yeah. How these, long does it take to build them? And that is another good question. 
How can yeah. I find any answers to this? <laughs> this I mean, it's the, the, the good thing about this being such a um, controversial project is that I think there are a lot of people who are doing research about it. You know, nice. so you can look up a lot. Um, I've done a bit of research myself just into the company um, because yeah, they, they seem are like a small company. They seem like a small company, right? Uh, but they are owned like so many other companies by a much larger holding company. Uh, this is Energy Capital Partners, which that's a fun one to do some research on. Just get on their website and start clicking around on projects and who they are. You know, it's definitely um, a pretty typical management team, like right on the front of their website. And you're just like, oh, look at all those white men in suits. You know, it's like the same. It just seems like business as usual, right? And they do, you can like click around and see the different projects that they work on. And um, they do a lot of uh, opportunistic energy. What does that mean? I think that's code for fracking. They, there are definitely some coal mines that are in their portfolio. So yeah, I have that question. So how green is it if the money that is, the profit that is made, because this is a, a for-profit endeavor, right? They're not doing this as a, you know, these are not philanthropists here to just provide green energy. They're doing it to turn a profit. Does that profit then go into dirty energy projects? And do they operate all over the country, or is this a California-based yeah. company? Okay. Yeah, definitely, they do. So the profits from this could very well go into coal mining in, say, West Virginia. Yeah, absolutely. And that absolutely. doesn't seem very green. It doesn't seem very green at all. Our building pipelines, yeah, it's not very green at all. Uh, and I think that, yeah, so the 30-year project, they turn their profit, 30 years are up, but they just leave all those turbines up there and then also like this this pristine grassland and prairie where there are um, important plants uh, endangered species it's a it's a sacred site for the Wiyot people like what happens to that place when the 30 years is up right do they just split I mean, there's a really long history all over the world especially here in Humboldt County you can just look around at the contaminated sites that we have that industry have left Right, and we are, we're kind of left holding the bag as citizens because somebody's got to deal with that. And is this land that is we out land, what are they currently doing with it? Is, uh, oh. is it something that they own? <laughs> no, 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 Rachel. Um, this has been, and, and so this, my unpracticed white person time, uh, I don't know that I'm saying the, can say the name of the, the place right. Um, but Bear River Ridge, as white folk call it specifically, is a very important cultural site, and it is privately owned, most of it. I believe some of it is some agencies, like some, some might be county land, uh, but a lot of it is privately owned. Um, it is a ranch that has been owned by one family for years. So I think that that's really, like, so they must stand to make quite a profit off of leasing this land to this right. company. They must. They must. And, and that's the thing that like really like sticks in me. Like that's the, the main point. Like you can probably mitigate a lot of other things, but how do you mitigate profiting off of genocide? Right? And, and that might sound like kind of a stretch, but you know, this is land that was stolen from people who were systematically slaughtered by the settlers so that they could have land. You know, just the idea that people can then profit off of that. And I know that the, the We Are Tribe is very opposed to this project. Um, and you know, and a lot of people within the community who are very opposed to it and this is not just NIMBYism, you know, this is not like, oh, not in my backyard, which I think that there's a lot of that, that people are just like, oh, I don't want to see wind turbines, I don't want to hear it, whatever, like, I don't agree with that. You could put them in my backyard if, if it was going to be in ecologically um, responsible and culturally responsible. Uh, but then the big problem is like the location, this place. Why is it this place, this beautiful, pristine, and I've never been up there, but I've talked to people who've been up there, and they say it is amazing, special, you can see so far, it is untouched, you know, like, why does it have to be there? Well, it mu they must, I hear that it is one of the best, windiest places in the country. Yeah. Doesn't that? Yeah. Right. 
Totally. Well, and it's and you know it's interesting to me until really thinking about this project. I never thought about wind as a resource, but it right. is like this is a resource that's being extracted. And I've heard multiple people say um, these are people whose scientific opinions I trust, and it and it does make sense to me that moving having wind turbines in an area changes the microclimate. And you think about how important microclimates are to this region. Like that is how, that's why the redwoods exist, is because we have these microclimates with the fog, especially. So how will that change with wind turbines? You know, and it just seems like, why this place? When we have like so many other places that are already <laughs> kind of Well, it, it does make sense too. Like, we've logged a lot of places. There have to be other right. hilly, elevated places that right. you would be able to place these on. Yeah, uh, yeah, right, like, what are the alternatives? Like, right. I think that that's a really important thing to think about, because this is, this is an alternative power source, and we need to have an alternative power source, right? So what are the alternatives? The same thing in a different place, you know? And I don't understand why, you know, what, I'm sure that there was a lot that went into deciding on this particular place, not only the wind, but, you know, the, the ease of getting the Do you think lease? that part of it had something to do with it already being privately owned? Yeah, probably, probably. Yeah, so the same project in a different place. I mean, solar, a lot of people are talking about solar, which is great. Yeah, you know? why don't we, why isn't that something that companies are, I suppose this isn't a great place for solar, right. but on a smaller level. On a smaller level. Well, and, and, and again, what I've heard is that if we, even if we all put solar panels on our homes, and we all put solar panels on every building, um, that that's not the solution because of our energy needs. Now, the real question here too is like, who's deciding what our energy needs are? If it's energy companies projecting what our energy needs are, I don't think that we need to take those. Like they, are, they really should not be dictating totally. what our needs are because their sole purpose is to turn a profit, yep. which I think is another problem with this project. And another possible right. alternative is publicly owned, publicly owned utilities. Like if we're not, if the goal is to provide a service rather than to turn a profit, then that makes it a different project, right? And then if it is something that is publicly owned, we have the power to decide what that project is gonna look like. And just, you know, the more people who are involved in the decision-making process, the more a project actually reflects the greater good, right? Absolutely. Yeah, but I think that we also just need to really like get innovative in our personal lives and in the larger community, like we just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And a lot of it I think is because the people who are, you know, these things take money, right? And the people who are in control of the money, I don't know, like things are working out for them. Changing the status quo is not necessarily important for them because they're making money. They're in power. Yeah, that part of my bangs is really weird. So I think you've got a wonky thing. I got a wonky thing. So just do whatever you gotta do. And you don't blow dry. Right? Oh no, blow dry. I don't. I never blow dry. And you know, and, and in light of all of this discussion, that is something that we can change too, right? The energy, the energy consumption, consumption is outrageous. Right. And people don't even think about it. The, right. the amount of things that we keep plugged in all the time is my toaster outrageous. has a light on it. Why does my toaster have a light on it? I unplug it all the time because it's annoying. Um, but yeah, and how do we, so you know what I really like to be, and I'm not an engineer, so I don't know how this would work out, but I know that there are engineers out there who could figure this out. Um, bicycle powered homes, right? You could hook everything up to have bicycle power, or even on a slightly larger scale, let's say we had a warehouse where there were a bunch of stationary bikes in it, all hooked up to power generation, and uh, we could go and do our allotment, right? Like instead of paying money for our energy, we could pay, we could use our kinetic energy to pay for energy. And of course there would be exceptions for people who are not able to do that, right? We can work that out. Because it's gonna be on a small scale and we're not trying to turn a profit, we're trying to provide a service. Right. Yeah. And it's even that. Yeah, even something that is small scale like that, just for individual communities, I mean, it really seems like it's about time that we really start thinking outside of the box. It is. And stop time. letting corporations tell us what to do oh and what we need. Right? You know? Preach, sister, preach. Yes. Gosh. That is exactly it. Uh, and 
do you think that Terrigen uh, researched the amount of energy that's used locally and um, thought that this would be something that would benefit us locally in the long term? Or do you think that it was more just finding a space that they thought they could afford to build and make them money? You know what? I'm sure that there is. There's a very complex uh, equation that they do, right? And that profit and loss and projecting what that profit and loss could be. And uh, I don't think that our long-term needs factored into that at all. Because my assumption. You know, let's get real. We use power. We use, we use power. We cannot do without it. Right. And there's so many people with health issues right. that absolutely cannot do without it. Yeah, yeah. And cannot create their own energy by bicycle. We right. need new sources of energy that are not going to start on fire. Right, because they're spontaneous and bust. Yes. Um, or right. Or ruin our environment, but but we yeah. yeah we need to figure something else out for the people. Like twenty years ago. Like twenty years ago. Yeah. And how many are there are currently um, are there places that have publicly owned utilities? Like, is that a thing that exists? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, they're public utility districts. There's actually one in Sacramento, uh, and so it is. It's voted in by the public. They we decide. You know. And we're the people who we put the, the members on the board. We can hold them accountable. There are public meetings. So it's different. And this, you know, obviously, like there's a lot of anger right now, justified anger at PGE uh, because their motive to turn a profit led to people dying, right? So obviously, obviously, corporations are not, they don't have our best interests in mind. Gosh, so, so how do we even there. begin something like this? Like, is this something that Eureka could, could Eureka start their own small grid or something like that? Like, how do we... Right. How in we theory. Like in this? theory, they can. Um, but and actually, the Board of Supervisors has, um, they have sent a letter in support of looking at restructuring Pacific Gas and Electric um, as public utility districts. So I think right now there's a lot of movement in that way. And so it does, uh, it can happen. You gotta talk to Redwood Coast Energy Agency. You gotta talk to the Board of Supervisors, you know. But first, right, before any of this happens, there's going to be a public meeting uh, because the Board of Supervisors has to decide whether or not to approve the permits for this Terrigen project.